OK, thanks. Thanks for coming. So uh, I think everyone came to my talk yesterday. So uh, let me just uh, briefly uh, summarize what we have done. So uh, of course, this is uh, based on the joint work with uh, Alan Zhu and uh, uh, Ankit, myself, and uh, Rafael Oliver, and Avi. So uh, first of all, uh, we have uh, in this paper we have shown the following theorem. So uh, let's say, given uh, matrices uh, I'm one. Uh, sorry, a one up to a i, uh, and a one prime up to a i prime. Uh, they are all in. C n times n, and we can decide uh, whether the determinant of uh, summation a i tensor x i is equal to the determinant of the summation of a i prime tensor x i. Uh, so where this xi are matrix random variables. So these are variables. Uh, yeah, just uh, variables in, let's say, C n times n. They are random, uh, they are variable uh, or in matrix form. And we can decide whether the determinant polynomials are equal or not in time. Uh, polynomial in n and m. Okay, so of course I assume the bit complexity of a uh, of ai are like some polynomial of m and n. And uh, also we are able to show that. So still, we are given this a1 up to a m, and a1 prime up to m prime. Uh, we are able to decide whether the uh, the orbit of a is intersect with the orbit of a prime, where these orbits are like all the u a, uh, all the b times a i times c for b and c in I sell n of c uh, in time polynomial in n and m. And moreover, we uh, what we can do is we can we can so for every epsilon bigger than zero, uh, we can find x and y such that uh, if, let, if I denote a i theta is equal to x times a i times y, the uh, summation of a i theta, a i theta dagger is equal to summation of a i, uh, a i theta dagger a i is equal to some uh, sorry, it's, it's equal to this, and they are epsilon close to some alpha times identity, where this epsilon means that uh, minus alpha times identity, the Fubini swarm is smaller or equal to epsilon. In time, polynomial in n and m, and log 1 or epsilon, uh, if it exists. So if it exists such uh, such x and y, uh, of course there are some conditions. For example, uh, there are some conditions when uh, there is no such x and y. For example, these ai are rank degenerate. Uh, like maybe all the ais are all equal and they are all just rank one. Then you cannot hope to get something that is identity. Uh, but if it exists, then we can find it in time. Uh, polynomial n and m and log 1 or epsilon. Okay? So there was the, the one 
an algorithm to test if uh, this is possible, then this uh, you know, polynomial factor, we know whether this happens or not. Yeah. And there was an algorithm to approximate it uh, to within epsilon, but it ran in time 1 over epsilon, as I call it with this one, which is your number. Yeah, so <coughs> previously there is an algorithm that has the uh, 1 over epsilon convergence, and 1 over epsilon is enough for deciding whether this is exists or not. Yes. Yeah. But uh, log one, uh, log epsilon is not enough for the other purposes. So the testing was also, only the testing was done in optimizing one of epsilon or log one of epsilon? Really, it only it testing. Testing, you, so for testing, you definitely need log one or epsilon, but there is no epsilon dependency for testing. Yeah, so yeah. The, the, there are two problems you can think about. One is just testing whether this determinant is identically zero, one of them. Okay. Right? For this, magically, uh, polynomial dependency is fine. If you get it to within one over n, you are fine. So you need only an algorithm that the running time is polynomial one over n. So this solves the null. Okay, because problem. if a one over n is like a one to zero one over n, then we're done. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, today I'm going to prove, like, not give the entire proof of everything, but I'm going to prove uh, several crucial lemmas. Uh, and hopefully it will cover most of the idea. So first of all, I'm going to show that, so as I mentioned yesterday, all these things can be reduced to, like, finding, uh, so you first uh, Minimize, find, uh, sorry, find the arc mean of the capacity of T of A. Uh, which is the uh, arc mean of, uh, let's say I can put a log here because log is monotone. So which is arc mean of log determinant of summation i ai x ai dagger minus log of determinant of x. So first of all, I need to find the arc mean uh, up to epsilon. And then I need to decide the unitary equivalent problem, which is whether there exists u and v in un of c, such that u i u a i v minus a i prime, the Fubini form is smaller or equal to epsilon, or is bigger than some exponential uh, in n times epsilon, or n and m epsilon. So uh, yesterday I have already reduced uh, to uh, uh, solving these problems to just uh, solving this whole optimization problem. And today I'm going to show the following uh, lemmas. So first of all, I need to show that epsilon is uh, one over exponential in some poly n and m is enough. OK, so epsilon doesn't need to be double exponentially small, just single exponentially small is enough. And then I, I will show that uh, I will show what is the self robustness of a geodesic convex function and there is a general theorem of how to minimize a self robust function And then I will prove uh, why this uh, log of the capacity uh, is g convex and self robust. Yes? 
if, if there was no minus log net x, then it's just convex uh, minimization, right? Uh, if, if in your objective, there was no, the second term wasn't present, then it's a convex problem, right? Right, right. So the log determinant is a convex thing. Now we've seen that even with this minus log term, it's going to become convex in this geodetic space. Right, so right. And then I will show, like, uh, so the the Weiding theorem. And the Weiding theorem for the Weiding theorem for unitary. And also combine these two together, I will show the so-called identity theorem or identity lemma. And they are going to be used uh, in like solving the unitary equivalent problem. Okay, so this is a plan for today. So let's start with uh, whether the uh, why this uh, poly uh, exponentially small is okay. So maybe we will just focus in on this thing. Uh, which is the uh, hardest uh, part of all this. So I will just focus on this orbit closure and all the others, uh, all the first one and the third one is just a uh, uh, simple modification of this. So uh, there is a, so uh, how do we show that if you get epsilon uh, that is exponentially small of the capacity is enough for the orbit closure problem. So first of all, I'm going to reduce the orbit closure uh, intersection problem to a sort of polynomial identity testing. So there is the theorem by, uh, so there is a theorem by, uh, let's see, uh, Darkson. and uh, Makama, which says that uh, so the uh, if so the orbit of the orbit of a intersect with the orbit of a prime if and only if oh yeah it's so uh, oh which Oh yeah, it, this is non-empty. Sorry, here is non-empty. Uh, if and only if, uh, so the determinant of summation i, uh, a i tensor x i is equal to a determinant of summation a i, a i prime tensor x i for all xi variable that is uh, in C, I think it's n6 times n to the power of 6. So clearly, if the orbit, is orbit intersect, then you can just uh, multiply here by u and here, here by b and here by c, you get a prime. And so they are equal for any x. But this lemma just says that if it's equal for like all the x that are polynomially large, then in, uh, the orbit also intersect. Yeah. And that's true regardless of the um, entry to the matrices? Uh, of course you, uh, yeah, yeah, the, it is true regardless of, any, yeah. When, uh, when you say uh, for all what it means is variable matrices, then there are matrices of variables for all means for all D by D matrices of size at most n to the two. Yeah, yeah, but the AIs, we don't assume anything about them. No, no, no. no they, they can be anything. anything. Any AIs. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's right. So what, I mean, but you really mean for all D uh, less than n to the six, and the matrices are of size D by D or something? Yeah, yeah, but I think it's exactly D by n to the six itself. No, we don't 
don't know that. But that's like okay. exactly uh, smaller. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, you wouldn't miss a lot. Yeah. Because they, they are variable. Yeah. OK, so uh, basically, you can see that uh, this one is just almost this one. But there, I just say the variables is n, n by n. But actually, you can make it to be larger. So th there is no difference. And so, uh, yeah, so in order to test this, Yeah, so in order to uh, uh, test this one, I'm going to show that. So uh, using this lemma, I will show that. So if uh, the orbit of A is not intersect, so the intersection of orbit A and orbit of A prime is actually empty, so then for all u and v that are in Sn, uh, sorry, un of c, uh, u times ai times v, the Fubini minus ai prime, the Fubini swarm summation is bigger or equal to some inverse poly exponential in poly n and m. OK, so this means that if the orbit is not intersecting for A and A prime, then there, for any A and A prime uh, that has like bounded bit, oh, sorry, the bit complexity is like uh, poly, uh, let's say the bit complexity is M, then here I should have the exponential of N M m and m. Bit complexity means that how many bits you need to represent the entries of A. So the entries of A are like exponentially in m large, or exponentially in m small. Uh, yeah, maybe I, I should just say some, uh, something about this without the death cell mechanics. Obviously, I mean, variance theory is about what, what do you want? You, you are asking whether two orbits intersect or not. I mean, the way to test it is using invariance. You know, what things don't change? What doesn't change the complete invariance of this group action, static group, group action, BAI times C, is completely understood. And these are all the polynomials that remain invariant. Polynomials in the AI substitute for the XI the values you want. Right? If you substitute whatever value you, you want, you get polynomials in the entries of the matrix of the AI. They don't change in the orbit. So if they are different for one such polynomial, then they don't intersect. Of course, closure doesn't change the four polynomials, right? But yeah. it's also so complete. It's, it's complete. These are all the invariants. What you what said is a bit sound, but the theorem says it's also Yes. So the, the first theorem that was proved was that you have to take matrices of all possible sizes. And they proved that it's sufficient to take polynomial size. In particular, it shows that this is the size of the bit problem. Like yeah, that's we right. Don't, uh, that's right. Yeah. So uh, let's say, assuming we have this lemma, then how do we use it? So we will apply this lemma on A that is the, like, uh, so we, we will first uh, scale A and A prime to doubly, to very close to doubly stochastic. And of course, after scaling, their orbit should also, inter should also intersect or not intersect. So, which means that I will apply A and A prime as the scaling of, a, of the original A and A prime. Now, if they actually uh, intersect, then they, they must be equivalent, unitary equivalent. Uh, if they are not intersect, then they must uh, be unitary, not be unitary equivalent. And this lemma just says that if they are not intersect, if their orbits uh, do not uh, do not intersect, then they are, their unitary difference is bigger or equal to some uh, inverse exponentially large number. And of course, if they intersect, then their unitary difference is uh, arbitrarily close to zero, depending on how I need to scale a and a prime. 
Yeah, so I just need to scale A and A prime like inverse exponentially close to identity. And then there are U and V dagger that are inverse, that make this thing inverse exponentially small, which is something smaller than this. Then I get uh, uh, to the decision problem here. Yeah, so inverse exponential is enough if we have this lemma. And the proof of this is pretty simple. So let's say their, their orbit is not intersecting. Then we know that there are xi's such that the determinant are not equal. So there exists xi such that determinant of the summation i, ai, tensor xi is not equal to the determinant of summation i, ai prime. Yeah, so let us, without loss of generality, assuming that the entries of ai are just integers of bit length m. So these are integers. So because these are two polynomials of uh, in the variable x of degree at most some polynomial in n and m, and the, this polynomial is not equal to this polynomial, so by Schwartz C lemma, we know that there are such xi with uh, size, uh, with bit size, let's say, exp with bit size that is m and uh, logarithmic in n and m, such that these uh, determinants are not equal. So what I mean is there exists an xi uh, with so integers. of size, uh, maybe just say integer smaller or equal to some exponential in m, n and m, such that this one is not true. So they are not equal. This is just by schwarz zipper lemma. You take a large enough field, and then you can have a zero. You can have a non-zero element. Yeah, so now we find such x. Let's denote it as x0. Maybe, maybe at this point you can say that there is a randomized algorithm. If we just wanted a randomized algorithm, yeah. it would be done. Yeah, if we just want randomized algorithm, we just take uh, something from here, just randomly sample, and then with high probability, we get a uh, witness. But now we want a deterministic algorithm. But for, this, uh, for the purpose of this proof, we just uh, it is enough to just get the existence of this thing. And then, so now we look at the polynomial. Let's, let's just uh, define the polynomial of A as the determinant of, of summation AI tensor xi0. So xi0 is the integer matrix of witness. And then what do we know? We know that this polynomial is invariant for, with respect to the unitary transformations, which means that P u times A times V dagger is equal to P of A dagger. And P of, yeah. And also these polynomials, these are all integers. And these are all integers. So the determinant is integer, which means that p of a minus p of a prime is at least a 1. So this also implies that p of u a v dagger minus p of a prime is at most one, uh, it's at least 1 for any unitary u and v. So for any u and v in and so then if we have this, then we know that uh, the p is a small polynomial. It's a polynomial of degree uh, at most, let's say, uh, is it? So p is a polynomial of degree at most m and polynomial in m and n. So the degree of p. 
So P is some is some polynomial in M and N, and the coefficient of P is some exponential in M N and M. And this means that uh, the, these two matrices cannot be too close. So if they are too close, if you act, uh, if you put a polynomial on them, then they cannot be uh, too far away. So let's say they are double exponentially close, but you put a polynomial, or degree polynomial, and coefficient exponential, then they should be still doubly, double exponentially close. So these two things. Which means that originally these two matrices must be inverse, at least uh, inverse exponentially far, far away. So this implies that at least uh, this one should be is bigger or equal to some inverse exponential in M N and M. Yeah, for every unitary U and V dagger, which proves uh, this claim. OK. Yeah, so this is a proof of the first thing. And so now let's let's show about the second part, which is uh, what is self-robustness and how to do self-robustness in geodesic convex optimization. Uh, so let's say so uh, the self-robustness. Uh, of a, uh, let's say, let's begin with a unitary uh, R function that map from R to R. So a function f is called rho self robust. Uh, if the following is true, so for every T bigger or equal to one, and for every sorry for for every t and for every x zero. Well, the one could be like oh yeah. For every t and for every x zero, so I have f t. Sorry, maybe there is no such thing. So for every t, I have f, uh, the third derivative of f t is upper bounded by the absolute value is upper bounded by rho times the second derivative i t. Okay, yeah. In particular, this implies that f is convex. Uh, sorry, for rho bigger for rho bigger than 0. So in particular, this implies that f is uh, convex and even strictly convex because this is, uh, so this is a non-negative value. So this is a non-negative value, which means that f is convex. And we have the very simple but very crucial lemma for self-robustness. It's like, as I mentioned yesterday, it's how close to quadratic is this function. And the theorem says that uh, so for every t of norm smaller or equal to 1 over rho, and for every x0, we have uh, fx0 plus f prime at x0 times t uh, plus 1 over 2e 
f double prime uh, at x0 times t. This one is smaller or equal to f x0 plus t, and is smaller or equal to f x0 plus f prime x0 times t uh, plus uh, e over 2 times f double prime x0. Sorry, there is a t square. OK, so basically, this is our original function at x0 with, uh, uh, with an offset t. And then if you just do the, like say, the Taylor expansion, you should get fx0 plus the derivative of x0 times t plus 1 over 2 times uh, f double, f, uh, double uh, f the second derivative of f at x0 times t squared. This is a standard Taylor expansion, but you get a remainder term. And the lemma just says that the remainder term can be bounded by the second order term. So you are getting a, the, a quadratic function with coefficient 1 over 2e as the lower bound, and a quadratic function with coefficient e over 2 as the upper bound. Now, of course, this is not uh, ex very tight, but uh, for the purpose of our proof is enough. So it just means that this function is locally quadratic. They are, they are the same quadratic function, but the co coefficient of the quadratic is just off by a constant factor um, in this interval. And the interval lines depending on uh, how large or how small rho is. Of course, when rho is very small, this means that the third derivative is changing very slowly. And you should expect the interval to be larger. So the interval is scaling with smaller rho. OK, so this is very simple, so I'm not going to prove it. But using this lemma, so we can see what is the general framework to uh, minimize a self-robust geodesic convex function. So what is uh, self-robust? for a geodesic convex function. This just means that, uh, or rho self-robust, this just means f of gamma t uh, is self-robust, or rho self-robust for every gamma, or unit speed. Geodesic gamma. Uh, what about the number? Actually, I don't. Could you remind me what the what a geodesic is? Is it like just an expression map? Uh, yeah. So uh, you you should think of like a surface, and the geodesic is just a path from one point to the other, and it's some kind of uh, minimum distance path. So this is so gamma is a function from. Uh, R to your manifold, and it's characterized by two things. So first, of yeah. So gamma here, gamma zero is equal to some uh, x zero inside this manifold, and gamma derivative of at zero is equal to some velocity, and the unit speed uh, geodesic just means the velocity has more what. Uh, yeah, so mm -hmm. in this problem. Like, is there a way to say what condition for a function from R to M make it a geodesic? Or, or potentially not every function like that is a geodesic, right? No, you have to have a metric on your manifold. You can say it after you have a metric. Geodesic is shortest path with respect to some metric. So, okay, so, so Even on R N, you can define several right. metrics. Right. Yeah. yeah. You need a metric. Once you have a metric, you have an also of geodesic. Geodesics are not always unique. In some spaces, in, okay. in, in Euclidean space, they are always unique, they are straight lines. Okay. In this space we are working on, so what's the space? The space here we are working on is the space of all positive definite matrices. Right? Because this capacity function is applied to x, which is a positive. positive. So you need a metric on all positive definite matrices. Right. The metric is 
very simple. Uh, you can write it down, or I can write it down if you want. Uh, it's very simple. It's not. We are not going to use it, but uh, yeah, but it's very simple. It's not uh, what you think as a straight line. <laughs> I feel yeah. Uh, so basically, for example, uh, in a ball, the geodesic is just uh, the the greater circle, and in something like a vision, the geodesic is like this. So you can see on a ball, the geodesic may not be unique. So you can go to this way or this way. But in this uh, one, it's like a Riemannian manifold. The geodesic is unique. Uh, I don't quite know, maybe. If you have to, if, if this is uh, all the, uh, uh, yeah, it's just a collection of all matrices, uh, there's the space over which we are optimizing, and you have to make this uh, zero. In here, then the geodesic between them, the shortest, I'm telling you, the shortest path between them looks like this. So it's, it should be a, <coughs> a function from 0, 1, right? You start at A, you want to say I start at A, this is point time 0, and I go in this very straight path to, to B. So this, and this is B point 1, right? So this gamma of A, B, of P, P is a parameter that goes along here, is this. You want to be at A in the beginning, so let me put A to the half here. Then you put A to the minus half here. B, A to the minus half. Take it to the power of P. They are all PSP matrices. You can take square roots and so on, right? A to the half. Okay, so you can see if t equals 0, this is the identity, and you are at a. If t equals 1, then these two things cancel, and you are at b. This then I put. Why? I, I cannot tell you. <laughs> okay, I guess if we you will come to it just at some point, how you thought of this as the right metric and... Uh, it was not using this, uh, it is geodesically convex uh, with respect to this metric. It was not. Yeah, it was no. So in a sense, you get lucky that the function you care about is v convex in a known metric. Yeah. Well, so also there is a simpler question of version of this, which is a matrix scaling. In matrix scaling, we already know that if you parameterize it by e to the something, instead of just uh, the something, then it is uh, convex and also mm -hmm. is self-robust. And we just uh, used the geodesic version of this for operator. Yeah, so this is a self-robustness for uh, geodesic convex function. So then how do you minimize it? Uh, that has a log one or epsilon convergence speed. So it's quite simple. So the algorithm is like this. So each iteration, you have an xt. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so if you do. Yeah, so if you just run gradient descent, you will converge in polynomial in one or epsilon, which is too slow for our purpose. So we need a second order algorithm that has a faster convergence rate. So, what is the algorithm? The algorithm is pretty simple. So, each each iteration t, you maintain a point xt. And then you just want to uh, find uh, some something like v uh, of norm. Let's say the function f now is rho g convex, uh, rho self-robust, uh, geodesically convex. And then I teach iteration. So you want to find a VT of norm uh, 
VP something is smaller or equal to uh, one or two row, I think. VP is a, is a bad name. Oh, uh, yeah. Sorry. Nice. Uh, you want to find a V of norm at most rows such that VI is, uh, is smaller or equal to, uh, I think, so sorry. VI is, is close, I will define it later, to the arc mean of uh, the following thing. So F prime at x t, oh sorry, x i is product with v plus the f double prime at x i is product with, so uh, maybe I will use gradient. This is a Hessian product with v tensor v. Okay? So basically, let's just uh, think of the tangent space here. So the v, uh, this v is in the tangent space of the manifold. And let's just think of the tangent space as, uh, let's say, c to the power of cn. So the, so the manifold itself is in some c to the n, and the tangent space is also in c to the n. So the, gra so the gradient here is actually a vector, and the Hessian here is a matrix. So you just, uh, uh, yeah, and it is true for our problem. So you just want to find a v that is very close to the arc mean of this uh, quadratic function. And of course, since it's geodesically convex, you should expect this one to be PIC. And there are like simple algorithms that get you to the arc mean uh, very quickly. And, but here, we just need uh, to be close in the following signs. Uh, is smaller or equal to one or two rows? Uh, is this whatever norm that defines a unique speed geodesic? So, so in this case for PSD matrices, what is the metric for which that is the geodesic? Uh, I, yeah, the metric is pretty complicated, but the unit speed it just means that the spectral norm of this is one. Yeah. Uh, I, th uh, I think you need to write it as an exponential of t times log of the this thing, and the no, a spectral norm of this matrix is what? It's log of uh, this one. Yeah, so unit speed just means the spectral norm of this is uh, what? Uh, so yeah, so basically you just find Vs such as Vs is close to the arc mean uh, in the following sense. So uh, let's call this function g of v. Then we should have g of v of s smaller or equal to a half g of v. So this looks like a bit strange, but g of v, the minimal is actually negative because you have a linear and you have a quadratic, so the optimal is always non-positive. So this means, so let's say this is minus 10, then this just says it's at, 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 at most of minus 5. So yeah, in, the, in this sense. And you can solve it very quickly using standard algorithms. So this is a reduction to a convex, to minimizing a convex. Yeah, to minimizing a uh, it's not one dimension. Yeah, it's a uh, high dimension. And then you just update your x t plus one to be gamma of uh, t. Uh, sorry, x s plus one is gamma of one or two rho. I think. What is gamma? So gamma is a geodesic, and gamma of zero is at x t, and gamma. Oh, sorry, x s. Gamma derivative at zero is 
this v of s. So basically, you first minimize, you first find a v of s that minimize that is very close to the R mean of some quadratic function, and then you go from x s uh, to uh, to x s plus one using a uh, geodesic that has uh, has a velocity v of s as a beginning. So you just uh, go for, for like one or two rows steps. Okay. No, it's a spectral norm or some or any norm that you you have to define what is unit speed geodesic and then it is uh, so the unit speed geodesic come to the definition of uh, the row self robustness of the function. So they are all related. You pick a norm and then you define everything. Why is it easy to do the optimization? Uh, this is a minimum. Uh, this is a convex set, so this is a convex function. You minimize a convex function in a convex set. Yeah, it's in very the easy. The yeah, this is not geodesic convex. It's just a convex, a quadratic function. Yeah, there are standard tools. For example, you can use maybe even ellipsoid or interior point, or even gradient design is enough because you just care about uh, one or two approximation ratio. So it's it's easy. There, there seem to be some details that are non trivial, no? If, like, I need a suppression oracle for that norm, the, the non trivial geodesic norm. Uh, yeah, definitely. Right. So now. Uh, or you just need a membership oracle, it's already fine. As long as you can compute this norm. Sure, like a membership oracle is enough here, but there is some error analysis that, that could definitely depend on how lifted the norm is and stuff like that, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. It, there should be some factor of how difficult it is, depending on like how complicated this norm is. But for our problem, it's just spectral norm, so it's easy. I see. So spectral law of some law of some. Yeah, it's just as a spectral norm of this guy. Yeah, it is easy. And so, assuming we have. So well, now let's see why this algorithm works. Uh, so first of all, uh, so first of all, I'm going to show that. Uh, so let's let's call this uh, sorry. So I will show that g of v at the optimal. So this is really this is the optimal v that is equal to the arc mean. This is a smaller or equal to some f uh, of x star minus f. Uh, X uh, at S, sorry. So the uh, I think maybe it's better to put this way. The absolute value of this is bigger or equal to some f x s minus f x star. So x star is the uh, optimal of f x uh, divided by some factor here. So. There are some factors here that I will show later. So is, the, is the rough idea that with that optimization, because the first step you compute in some sense the velocity. Now in, in a usual world, you would just take a small step in the direction of in the velocity. Yeah. But because you're in this g convex space, you want to take a small step in the geodesic. Uh, right, exactly. So that's, that's what we're yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's pretty simple. Yeah, and then the result is an explicit reduction to the convex to the normal right. Euclidean right. convex set. 
in the case that it's a bomb. Yeah. So, and then I will show that if you use the so x f i plus one, uh, I think f i s minus f x i s plus one is uh, bigger or equal to some factor, uh, almost the same as some this above. So V star is the optimal of G. Okay. This is the uh, optimal of S. Is this, uh, F. So G is that thing, the quadratic function. Oh, okay. So G is defined like a particular excess. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And V star is the optimal? Yeah, we just want to find the direction. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, we just want to find a good direction to go. And the optimal one is, of course, a very good direction. But uh, something close to optimal is also a good enough direction. And once you have this, it is pretty easy to see what is a linear convergence. Because let's say this one is this one. So uh, this one is like uh, define this as some value, some st. Then because every time I decrease the value by a, a some Proportion fraction, and this is not any function of t. This is just something fixed. So I will decrease the st by something fixed, uh, by a fraction that is fixed. So I will get to epsilon in like log one or epsilon iteration times uh, whatever this fix is. The distance to the optimal optimum shrinks by a constant factor. Uh, uh, this is different. This is a function value shrink by a constant factor. Yeah, but also the distance to optimal as well. Yeah. So, so just one point. So this uh, v star is the optimum of argument v, subject to that norm constraint. Yeah, subject to norm constraint. So, so I'm actually confused. Nowhere the Lipschitz class of the norm appears, like in 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 the analysis. Uh, it only appears in like how difficult it is to find the to find the optimal. But once you have uh, the optimal, then there is nothing. Ah, so you're yet. analyzing this for the optimum v star. Right? Yeah. And then there is some other analysis that would require. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm assuming you can find the vis such that this is true. And if this is true, it's easy to see that g of vis is uh, the absolute value is at least a half of this, uh, and it at least this. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, thanks. Yeah. So the norm only affects uh, how difficult it is to optimize. And the proof is pretty simple. So I just need to say there exists one v such that uh, this g of v uh, in, the, in the norm bound. There exists v such that the norm is smaller or equal to 1 or 2 rho as before, such that g of v, the absolute value is bigger or equal to fxs minus fx star over something fixed. So if there exists one, then there the optimal one should be even smaller. So what is the what is this v? This v is very simple. So I take a geodesic gamma. So gamma zero is at uh, x size, and gamma whatever is at uh, x t. Uh, sorry, x star. And then gamma, the derivative of this, which is the velocity of gamma, the norm, is something like 1 over 2 rho. So I, I, will, I find a geodesic from x size to x star. And then the, I will make sure that the geodesic has norm 1 over 2 rho at 0. So the speed of the geodesic is like a 1 over 2 rho. And then I will just take v to be this thing. Uh, so why is this uh, OK? So let's see. Uh, so or maybe I need something different. I will take it the norm to be 1, and I will take v to be like 1 over 2 rho times the derivative of 0. 
So I will find a unit speed geodesic from xs to xr, and then I will take v to be something smaller. So, so what is uh, so let's let's just uh, consider this thing. So what happen if I move? What happen if I move gamma of one or two row? So I will have a point at gamma of one or two row. So this is the point x zero uh, x i and somewhere here, and what I'm writing is the function value, and this is a point. Something here there is x r, and along this path there is this is a convex function. So whenever I have a point here, the value should be decreased by the so the value decreasing uh, of this guy. So the decreasing value, uh, the ratio of the decreasing value here compared to here is at least the ratio of this thing and this thing, because it's convex. So it's uh, lower than this line. Uh, yeah, what I'm saying is just uh, something. Very simple. So you have the, you have this uh, geodesic, and you have x, s here and x star here. Let's say the distance along the geodesic is some distance of this. And then I will have uh, uh, here. I will I will move uh, I will move to x star at at least a one or two row. So my function value of this guy, I have uh, gamma at one or two row is bigger or equal to uh, sorry, I have x i minus this this guy, which is the uh, height here, divided by the f x i minus f x star, which is the height here, is at least uh, one or two row divided by the distance. OK, I'm just I'm using geodesic convexity here. So this is a convex function. And the distance here is like this. And the distance here is over two row. So you need so I uh, sorry, the distance here is one over two row. So the amount of decreasing is at most at least the amount of decreasing here times the ratio of this guy and this guy. So this one picking those two row is because of this definition of self opacity. Yeah. Yeah uh, actually this is true for any yeah. like uh, any value uh, let's say Let's call it uh, whatever key size. Is the maximum time for which the quadratic approximation is? Yeah, that is like the maximum for, because this uh, t is like one over row. So maybe you can put one over row there. But yeah, this is like the maximum step. And then you know that having this, you and you know that the quadratic function is a very good approximation of this. Uh, of this uh, function, so you mean if you minimize a quadratic function, it's equivalent to minimizing this function up to a constant. So then everything just follow. Yeah. So and if you have this, and then this one is also very simple. You just use the approximation again. So you first use the approximation to show that the function value is small, so the quadratic is small. And then you use the approximation again to show that if the sorry if the quadratic is large, and you use the approximation again to show if the quadratic is large, then the actual value is also large. If you just uh, go uh, this way as I define. So this was this known before, like how to optimize uh, the self-robust g-convex uh, functions uh, with log one or epsilon conversion? No, the self-robustness was uh, invented by a previous paper of matrix scaling by the s almost the same set of authors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also there's an independent work uh, by Madre and his students that get the same thing of self-robustness for matrix scaling. Yeah. 
فز... Yeah. It is not very natural because it's not uh, homogeneous. Yeah. 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 Homogeneous. Okay, I see. yeah. Uh, power working? Because it's simply not true for a three half. Yeah. So you will see when I prove this thing, you will see why uh, the it is true for with not with no power. No, no. So I guess there are two questions: whether log cap is g convex and self robust, and whether the algorithm would have worked for g convex and um, what was self concordant. Uh, Oh, I'm self whether the algorithm would have worked for G convex self concordant uh, uh, it, it is a bit subtle because the, so for self concordant you you read so for G convex is very simple so your region is no matter which point you are at no matter what is your hydrogen you can always go one over two row but for self concordant the amount you can go is something depending on the current value of the hydrogen. Yeah. So it's not completely trivial, but it should be doable to make sure the cell con uh, the like interior point method working I think it was done also. I think okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. uh, okay. There is a notion of self concordance in the geodesic. I see. I think it was done. I see. But low capacity is not self concordant. Yeah. Uh, no, should we, asking, should we take a break or? We can take a break, yeah, five minutes. Okay, yeah. 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 I, think, I think we, we know, very, I know very little about all this work on the geode you know, mm. geodesically convex optimization. We know that the people have done the, uh, you know, the, uh, how do you call it, the order one, you know, gradient descent, they mm. understand. Mm. That there are notions of self you, know, you can define self concordant and then I think the uh, you know like the analog exists there. And what mm. what I, I don't know that anybody tried to uh, um, optimize a function that's not uh, right. I mean I did this did you see anyone? Uh, no, I think even in convex optimization, so usually we people believe that self concordance is like the go to tool that you will use. Yeah. So, uh, so you just guess that it's not self concordant, but it could be self robust. Uh, yeah, oh, because it was invented in, in the, context of in the yeah. yeah, in the case of uh, yeah, the commutative case, it was. Uh, yeah, but in matrix kind of case, we just uh, basically guess that it is self robust. Mm. The, thing yeah. is, the thing that is uh, is interesting is uh, if you are talking about the application in the matrix scaling. We already knew, we knew for a long time that you can get convergence in log 1 over epsilon. Mm -hmm. So it was not really needed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the re reason it was invested, invented in this previous paper is just to make the algorithm more, more fa mm -hmm. faster. Mm -hmm. uh, there was polynomial time algorithm we wanted, you know, really fast algorithm. Mm -hmm. So that's why it came out. Yeah. Yeah, so basically, there is this uh, some fix in here, which is really like the distance, which is really proportional to uh, the, the distance to the optimal. So because uh, if the distance is very large, you go to through a, let's say, let's think of rho, always think of rho as a constant, maybe a half. And then you always go like a constant fraction of this. So you, the dec decrement will be the distance. Yeah. The distance between the values, the, so what distance is it like? The distance with the geodesic. So you, you go through a unit speed geodesic. How long does it take from, for you to go from x to x star? And in this paper, so we show that, so we show that the distance from not exactly x star, but x star of epsilon, and x0 is smaller or equal to or any xs 
is smaller or equal to some uh, polynomial in n m and uh, m and uh, log one or epsilon. Uh, no, this is a distance in the exponential thing already. Right. Uh, yeah. This is very exponential. Exactly. Yeah. The distance the, yeah, after you take the log of the, log of the matrix, then it's the polynomial. Yeah, so this means that the distance in this geodesic space is very close. But, so the, but this is not the real distance of like in Euclidean space because the geodesic here is an exponential of some matrix. So the further you go, the larger it is becomes. So for example, the, you can go through, so if, let's say this is some norm matrix of spectral norm 1. And then you go at t equal to 1, this is just a small matrix. But if you go to t equal to poly n, this one is going to be exponentially large. Yeah. But this is the beauty of geodesically convex, because this one is exponentially large. Even if it's convex in the usual space, the distance will be exponential. Mm -hmm. So the, you can only decrease by exponential factor at every step. But you go through this geodesic space, now the distance suddenly becomes just a polynomial. Yeah, the geodesic distance is polynomial. So it's unit speed, but it's not unit speed in Euclidean space. It's u unit space speed in this geodesic. Yeah. Another way to think about it, if you're in Euclidean space, you start, let's say, the, the algorithm at the identity, and your optimum is some x star. In the, in the Euclidean sense, let's say you're, you're just thinking about, it's not quite the same, because we are doing capacity here and not Euclidean now, but there is a relationship between Euclidean, right? We showed you yesterday, a uh, relation between capacity and the Euclidean uh, distance. So roughly, you are. Uh, cutting this uh, distance by a multiplicative factor of less than one at every step. Right. This is equivalent to what's happening here in the geodesic space. Yeah. And that's again an exponential conversion. So, okay. So, could you somehow then speed up usual corners optimization somehow by uh, going to a different geodesic where also the same function is convex? Uh, yes, like, okay, so the log on the epsilon convergence is just the rate. Yeah. But, but the constant that appears uh, multiplied to it depends, as you said, on uh, this distance. But as, as, you, as you observe, like the distance becomes shorter if you go to the right geodesic. So potentially, you can even speed up usual convex optimization. Yeah, for matrix scaling, we definitely use this exponential to make the algorithm converge much faster compared to like you just run plant gradient descent. Yeah, I, I believe there should be other applications when you, and also it's not even really a geodesic. You just need to find the correct changing of variables. Right. Uh, yeah. What is the intuition behind like going along geodesics? Why not like even just plain gradient descent? Well, plain gradient descent, the uh, distance is exponential. So it's not uh, really. What, what is special about geodesics? Like you have a direction, but you can think of going along other yeah. Uh, well, well, it is geodesic. You have to make sure that along your path is convex. So whatever path you find, it has to be convex. <coughs> so, yeah, basically you find a, basically you, uh, so you find a, uh, like I could find a different path on which my function is convex and try to go along that path. Uh, yeah, in principle, that is also OK. If you can find another path that your function is convex, uh, and also the distance. I think this has to do with the, somehow the metric captures this problem well. Shortest path according to this metric is the fastest way to go in some sense. I, I don't know what what's so I mean, what, what you're asking is fine, but when will you come up with such a path? <laughs> Here you have a, a natural space, well studied space, only space that is a very natural metric. And um, I don't think it's a complete coincidence that capacity is, <laughs> capacity is convex. It's really the non commutative analog of the uh, uh, exponential change of variables in the, in the commutative case, in matrix scaling. Mm -hmm. In matrix scaling, the usual way of phrasing it is non convex. 
just you know make a row and column sum one. It's, it's, it's not a convex function, but when you move to exponential variables, just you, then it's what's called what's called the geometric program, right? And then it's convex. So it's it's a non commutative analog. It's uh, you know maybe it should have been expected. But, uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, so this framework is really has a lot of freedom. You can come up with other paths. As long as they work, they are fine. But for us, there is like a well-defined path that, uh, that is working, so. I have a question, maybe a, an ignorant question, but uh, I'll ask it anyway. OK. So I remember that there is also an interpretation of multiplicative weights as if you go with on the geodesic with respect to KL divergence, right? So uh, this is not a metric, but let's ignore that for now. I'm, I'm not, I so haven't heard about that so notion. It's, but it's just Miller design with respect to. No, but I think that you. I, I think that you are right. The metric when you do, uh, not multiplicative, you mean the matrix multiplicative weights. The matrix, uh, when you do, you, you can, you can uh, do a non commutative uh, multiplicative weight updates. It, it was done, I mean, there are these papers of our own color, this is what you were talking about. Anyway, there, there is a matrix multiplicative weights, and then you work on on the same PSD matrices, and uh, the, the essentially the same matrix, the metric comes up, yes. The same metric like here? Yes. Okay. It's implicit then, yes. Uh. Yeah. Okay. So, I so we finish like uh, uh, the this thing like how to minimize the self robust function in general, and then I will start by showing like why this law capacity is geodesic convex and self robust. And in this proof, you probably will see why the self, it is self robust but not self concordant. So. Yeah, so uh, we are going to change the, uh, the argument, the norm argument here slightly. So in particular, what we will show is uh, the following thing. So if you define, uh, so for every point x, if you define like g of x at point t, for every x and delta, g of x delta at point t as the following function, the log of the determinant of summation i, ai, x a half times e to the uh, t times delta x a half times ai dagger minus. So this x is positive semi-definite, and delta can be, delta is symmetric. minus log of determinant of x times e to the t delta. So for any delta with spectral norm smaller or equal to 1, uh, we, we can show that g double prime of x at delta of t is bigger or equal to, I think, it's some constant 1 over 2e, uh, or just 1 over 2 x delta of t. Uh, 
uh, for every t. So it's not a big change than the previous one, just a change of notation, right? Uh, if you remember the metric over there, you can see where these are, x to the half is coming from, x to the half times the exponent. Uh, yeah. So yeah, exactly. So you just uh, change this. You just say that the norm of the delta is uh, smaller or equal to, uh, yeah, the norm of the delta is smaller or equal to 1, and then you define this function is really the uh, the f composed with a geodesic path starting from x, uh, but the velocity is not exactly delta. The velocity here is like x times delta. Uh, but uh, so you, if you use a previous notion, it should be that x times delta the norm is smaller than one. But here we just use delta, the norm of delta is smaller than one. So. Yeah, so it's not a big change. And just a second, the determinant is the same. The term you could have written it x to the half. Yeah. It's the same thing. Yeah, you could written as this. <laughs> Yeah, it's just uh, the log of the capacity if you go along the geodesic path of this, defined by delta and starting at uh, x. And this, is, this says that for every x and very symmetric delta of spectral norm at most 1, the function is self-robust, which is exactly the definition that we need for self-robust and put in the framework, and then we can minimize it. OK, so we are going to prove this. And so there are several things that are not really needed. First of all, the, the x is not really needed because I can just put in, because this is really the determinant of x times the determinant of uh, e to the t delta, and this one is a constant. And also, I can merge x to ai, because I have no assumption on ai. So basically, I just need to prove when x is identity. I will treat ai times x as x. And also, the for all t is not really needed, because uh, I can start, I can rewrite it as ai times e to the uh, half at t0 x a half e to the t minus t0 times delta, e to the a half times t0 delta, and then times x a half ai. And I can merge everything to a, because I have no assumption on a. Mm -hmm. And then I, if I take the derivative at 0, I'm taking the actual derivative of this guy. So I treat this as a new variable, like t. The new t, if I take the derivative of new t at 0, I'm taking the derivative of old t at t0. So it's not really important. So we just need to prove this one. So it is enough to prove the log. So uh, it is enough to prove this gt, which is the log of determinant of summation i, ai e to the t delta ai dagger minus log determinant of uh, e to the t delta. This gt satisfies g double prime t for t at 0 is bigger or equal to 1 over 2 triple prime I, uh, I t for t equal to 0. So if I prove this, I also prove this just by uh, changing AI to some other thing. Uh, you prove this for every AI and, and every symmetric delta of norm at most one. OK, so let's uh, start proving this. Sorry? That sort of 
Are you particularly sure that this change of variables makes the function convex? Right? Uh, ah, yeah, because uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. all right. Yeah, this proves the convexity as well. Right. Yeah, so let's let's just uh, prove this. So for notation simplicity, we define the following matrices. The B T is equal to summation of i a i uh, e to the t delta and times a i dagger. And CT is equal to uh, summation of i, ai times delta times e to the t delta. And they, they have the same singular uh, eigenvalue space, so they are actually exchangeable, these two things. So I can put it uh, whatever way I want. And I have dt, which is summation of i, ai delta square e to the t delta. Ai and uh, et is equal to summation of i delta cube. It's really just uh, b is zero power of delta, c is uh, one power, d is two power, and e is three power. And I think maybe this notation is clear more or less clear than I just put a power there. Okay. Yeah, there is no global unlike, change of variable. Unlike, unlike matrix uh, scaling, where there is a global change of variable. Right. This geodesics is really a local change of variable. Uh, so what is the uh, derivative of So let's start with the derivative with respect to g. And it is really the derivative of log uh, determinant of bt. Uh, derivative of t minus uh, log of determinant of e to the power of t or oh, dt. Okay. So this guy is pretty simple. Uh, the log of determinant of e to the power of t is just uh, the so the log of the determinant of uh, e to the something is just uh, the trace of this thing. So it's the, this one is the derivative of the trace of t delta over dt, which is just equal to the trace of delta. Yes, uh, this is an identity log determinant of exponential is equal to the trace. And then you have the derivative of log of the determinant uh, of uh, bt, which is uh, equal to the trace of bt inverse uh, der derivative of bt over dt. So uh, basically, you should think of it as there is a log. So log of something is equal to like something inverse. And the determinant will become like a trace, and then you will take the derivative of this guy. And anyway, this is an also a known identity, known equality, minus the trace of delta. OK, so now what is the derivative of, derivative of bt with respect to t? So by that definition, I will just take the derivative of e to the t delta. So this is equal to trace of b e t inverse. If I take the derivative with respect to t, I just uh, put a delta uh, uh, off, and I will get c t, right? So I will get c t minus trace of delta. OK, so. Uh, then let's look at the second derivative. 
And this is equal to, so you take the derivative with respect to a trace. So you have the chain rule, which just says you will first take derivative with respect to the bt inverse. And then you will take derivative with respect to ct. And then, because this is a constant, if you take derivative, it's uh, just uh, going to vanish. So it's really just this thing. So what is the derivative of bt inverse? So what is a, so how do you take derivative of some function inverse? It will be equal to something like, uh, so you first uh, take the, so it will be equal to something like f squared times the derivative of the function, right? Yeah, the, there is an analog of this for matrix value function, which is it will be equal to ct times, uh, so it will be equal to negative ct times bt inverse, and then you take derivative with respect to bt times bt inverse. So the only difference is yeah, the function is commutative, but matrix is not commutative. So we get two inverse on both sides instead of one, one over a square. And then you have the derivative of ct, which is uh, very simple. It just will become dt, dt times bt inverse. OK, so what is this guy is also ct. So I get this thing. And now, let, now let's just. Uh, expand everything out. So what is this? This is equal to minus the trace of summation of i equal to uh, so this is a trace of uh, let's see, so the uh, trace of uh, b trace of minus trace of ct bt ct bt plus the trace of uh, dt bt inverse. No, inverse the oh, sorry, bt inverse, bt inverse. Yeah. So what is a uh, what is a so let's, let's just consider it is uh, sufficient, as we said, to just prove the, maybe I erase it, just to prove this uh, is bigger than 0. Uh, I, as convexity-wise, it's sufficient to prove that this is bigger than 0 at just t equal to 0. So if I take t equal to 0, I will take t equal to 0 here. And what would happen? So Uh, so basically, I will get uh, something like trace. So what is bt? bt is really now, because t is equal to 0, it's just summation of ai, ai dagger, bt for uh, b0. And so we can define, so let's define. Uh, AI theta is equal to B0 inverse times AI. This is just a, a change of variable. And what do we get from AI? We know that AI theta, sorry, a half. AI summation of AI, uh, AI theta transpose. Uh, conjugate transpose now is equal to identity. Because if you look at this, this is uh, AI times AI dagger. And then you have a summation here. But the B is this one to the power of negative a half. Uh, B is this one. And then you have a to the power of negative a half here and there. So it will become identity. So you get this. And now I can simplify the expression as above. Uh, I can make. 
I can make this b inverse to be b negative one half, b negative one half, and then I can put here b negative one half and put here b negative one half. So what I really get is uh, b negative one half times c times b negative one half. So what is c? C is something like a i times delta of e t delta, but b negative one half times a i is a i theta. So what I get here is really trace of uh, AI theta times delta times AI theta square, right? So basically, it's this matrix square times this. They are the same matrix, so it's this matrix square. And this matrix is uh, this guy. Uh, and then I have a plus, so I can also do the same trick. I put a b negative a half here and a b negative a half here, and then it will become the b negative a half times dt, where dt has dt is also having this one, so it will become ai delta square ai. Okay. And if, if you just want to prove that it's bigger or equal to 0, this is actually the matrix version of Jason's inequality. So what does Jason's inequality tells us? It tells us that summation of ai x i square is bigger or equal to summation of ai x i square for ai in a simplex. Do you want AIXI? Oh, sorry. Sorry. For summation of AI is equal to 1 and AI is bigger or equal to 0. This is a Jason's inequality. Just uh, use the convexity of, of uh, the function square. And if you look at here, these are actually the AIs and these are the XI. This is the XI. Or it's not even x i, it's just one simple x. So this is x square, and this is summation of a i x square, and this is b. This is a matrix version of Jason's inequality. Here I'm using the fact that the summation is identity, and each one of them are positive semi definite, which is exactly the notion. Same. Yeah, this is a matrix Jason's inequality. But uh, for in order to prove the second order robustness, I will need to expand this out. So I will. So first of all, these are like in AI square. These are AI, so they are not homogeneous because of the summation is identity. But I can make them homogeneous uh, by just uh, multiplying uh, identity there. Plus the trace of AI summation of AI tilde AI tilde I dagger times the sorry there is a summation missing okay I get this one and. And then, uh, I mean, of course, we want to do it more elegantly, but uh, we cannot do it. So we just uh, expand everything out. So it's just equal to the summation of ij minus the trace of ai theta delta ai theta transpose inverse times aj times delta times aj theta transpose. And plus the summation of trace of AI theta AI theta transpose AJ delta square AJ. Okay. And then this is very simple. I just merge I together. So what what is the IJ term here? It will be do the simple calculation, it will be 
AJ delta AI delta minus delta AJ VI times the descent transpose, which is delta times AI delta dagger AJ minus delta, uh, sorry, AI AJ delta. So delta is symmetric. Uh, let's see why this is true. So I have this term, AJ dagger AI times delta and this term, which is a delta square. So basically, uh, it is this term. So, so let's label it 1, 2, 3, 4. So 1 times 3 will be, let's say this is 5, this is 6. 1 times 3 will be a version of 5. But I switched the label. Here is j, here is i. So this is 1 times 3. OK, and uh, 1 times 4 will be a version of 6. What is 1 times 4? 1 times 4 is you have a delta in the middle, and then you have another delta. So I have two delta here. It's like this. And then you can also see like 2 times 3 or 2 times 4 are, all, uh, are the same. So 2 times 3, you have a delta in the middle, and it's neg you have one delta in the middle and another delta in the middle. And 2 times 6, you have a delta square. So it's the same. So you get uh, this one. And this is, uh, let's call this matrix Pij and this matrix Qij. So what we know is this is equal to summation of Ij, a half trace of Pij minus Qij times Pij minus Qij conjugate transpose. So of course, this is bigger or equal to 0. And yeah, using this brute force way, we are able to also prove the convexity or even prove the matrix JSON inequality. But let's just remember it is equal to this value, which will be crucial for the third order derivative. And now let's just uh, take the third order derivative. And the third order derivative is also uh, pretty straightforward. You can just use this rule. And it's going to be a very long expression. Maybe let me just write it. It's equal to some minus 3 times the trace of bt, bt inverse, ct, bt inverse. This is like you just take a derivative with respect to ct, and then you get dt. Yeah, and then you can, and then plus 2 trace of ct bt inverse, ct bt inverse, ct bt inverse. This is like you take a derivative with respect to bt inverse, and then plus the trace of bt inverse et. So this is, you take a derivative with respect to the dt here, you get a et. And also you, you, you have to take the derivative of the bt here, which is uh, this term. So that's why there are three of them. Because here you get two. You get one ct, one ct, so you get two, and then another come from here. So there is a three here, and a two here, and a one here. So I'm not going to do the ex exact calculation, but if you figure it out, it will be at t equal to 0, it will be equal to summation of i and j up to i minus the trace of summation i equal to 1 up to i ai theta, ai theta transpose multiply pij minus qij times Pij minus Qij transpose. So it's basically the same thing as above, but uh, with this additional term. But what do, 
What do we know about this additional term? We know that the summation of these matrices without the delta is identity, and delta has spectral norm at most 1. So this matrix has spectral norm at most 1, which means that and you know you multiply, so you know that trace of anything, this is smaller or equal to trace of x if the spectral norm of delta is at most 1. Uh, so you just prove that this is smaller or e than this. So with a half rich constant. So you prove the second, the self robustness of this function. Yeah, uh, I think uh, we are running out of time, so I probably will not uh, describe this anyway. The, the other thing is irrelevant to this uh, framework. It's just a, a difficult artifact of solving unitary equivalent when there is inexact calculation. OK, yeah, I think it's the uh, end of the talk. Thanks for coming. Any questions? <laughs>